हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई हेम निशा शर्मा एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश द टॉपिक अंडर डिस्कशन टुडे इज तुगलक गिरीश कनाड तुगलक एज ए कॉन्टेम्प्रेरी प्ले अबाउट अ कॉन्टेम्प्रेरी सिचुएशन द प्ले तुगलक इज रिटर्न बाय द फेमस इंडो इंडियन रेमेडिस गिरीश कनाड It was published in Kannada in 1964. It is Girish Kanar's second play. His first play was Yayati. Tuglak was an immediate success on stage. It was first produced in Kannada and then in Hindi, Bengali, and Marathi productions followed. And in 1970, there was an English production in Bombay, which was a major success. Tuglak is a historical play dealing with the last 5 years of the troubled reign of Muhammad bin Tuglak. While writing it, Kanad himself was struck by the parallelism between the reign of Tuglak and contemporary history. Tuglak was a powerful personality, but he disintegrated within a short span of 20 years in a mood of disillusionment that set in short span of 20 years and the mood of disillusion that set in corresponds well with the mood of frustration at the end of the nehru era i did not write i did not consciously write about the nehru era i am always flattered when people tell me that it was about the nehru era and equally applies to development of politics since then but i think well that is a compliment that any playwright would be thrilled to get but it was not intended to be not intended to be a contemporary play about contemporary situation i think if one gets involved with one's character or one's play then it should develop into some kind of a true statement about oneself i think a play can be only as contemporary as the playwright is if the writer does not have contemporary convictions or is not committed the play will not be contemporary says girishkana himself at every step the play echoes the chaos disillusionment and corruption that followed the nehru era and this is one of the most important reasons of the popularity of the play Tuglak ruled in the 14th century and Nehru in the 1950s and 60s. Striking parallels can easily be drawn between the two ages. This makes Tuglak as a great political allegory. An allegory is apparently a story, but it carries within it a hidden moral lesson for the most discerning readers. It tells the story of the reign of Tuglak and the rapid disintegration of his personality. it also tells of the shattering of ideals after the death of nehru and the frustration and corruption that followed karnad uses history and places facts of history in the midst of imaginary incidents and situations to dramatize history the play can be seen as historical in only in a very special sense that is it could be seen embodying the muslim idea of history as biography like babar nama and akbar nama the serial enactment of the 20 year reign of tuglak could be seen as tuglak nama to reinforce the sense of the mirror of history a character has also been introduced by karnad a court historian called burney but perhaps not importantly the play can be read as an enactment of projective memory the past viewed as a projection of the present the tremendous popularity of tuglak and its reception as a classic in kannada literature is mainly due to the contemporary sensibility tuglak in fact enacts an indian situation of an alien emperor a dream of cities and empires subjecting the culture of the people to colonial strain burney's definition of history aims at two points 
The first one is lasting results. And the second point is that it is produced by learning map. Both these conditions are fulfilled in Karnad Suglab, which is a historical play at Shakespeare's Richard II and Christopher Marlowe's Edward II. Both these plays are mirror to the monarchy, which was an institution in itself during the time described in the play. Neither Richard II nor Edward II was the monarch of the Elizabethan age. They had lived much earlier with their virtues and vices, strengths and weaknesses. Shakespeare and Marlowe made them acceptable to their own period. Karnal also, with his aesthetic and artistic adeptness, has presented to Gluck, which has great interest for the populace and the political magnates of contemporary India. In Tukluk, a historian may find lapse with regard to the accuracy of the facts of history. In fact, Karnad has made use of Sultan's character to suit his theme that an idealist student can remain idealist if he is ambitious of perpetrating his own power. Karnad uses the Sultan only as a background to make the people understand just and interpret contemporary realities. His purpose is to show that in history, faces change, but forces don't. Karnat's Tughlaq should be studied to find parallelism between the realities of the 14th century India, ruled by a Sultan, and the 20th century democratic country governed by the Prime Minister and his colleagues in the cabinet. Karnat's own statement, which is quoted by U.R. Anant Murthy in his introduction to Tukla. What struck me absolutely about Tukla's history was that it was contemporary. The fact that here was the most idealistic, the most intelligent king ever to come on the throne of Delhi and one of the greatest failures also. And within the span of 20 years, this tremendously capable man had gone to pieces. This seemed to be both due to his idealism as well as the shortcomings within him such as his impatience, his cruelty, his feeling that he had the only correct answer. Karnan mentions some facts of history and places them in the midst of imaginary incidents and situations to dramatize history in order to be of contemporary, contemporaneous interest. During the reign of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, the Hindus and Muslims did not trust one another. The Muslims call the Hindus bloody infidels who deserve to be kicked, and the Hindus suspected the Muslim and could hardly believe that a Muslim leader was going to see them prosper and to exempt them from taxes without having his own benefit in view. A Hindu says, we didn't want an exemption. Look, when the Sultan kicks me in the teeth and says, pay up your Hindu dog, this speech reflects the Hindus are molested and wrongly behaved by the Sultan, while the Sultan declares about the equality in the country. People are not in his favor completely. In an age of religious fanaticism and hostility between Hindus and Muslims, his broad-minded religious tolerance seems foolish to the Muslims and cunning to the Hindus who suspect his motives. The young Muslims reacted sharply and violently to this statement of the Hindus and called him an ungrateful threat. The old Muslim warned the young Muslim becoming a friend of the Hindu and said, Beware of the Hindu who embraces you. Before you know what, he'll turn Islam into another caste and call the Prophet an incarnation of his God. Despite the best efforts of Muhammad to bring the Hindus and Muslims together and unite them in one bond of brotherhood, he failed. The reason of Tughlaq's failure is, as mentioned by Vila Noble Das, all his brilliant ideas were doomed to fail because they were implemented impulsively without weighing all the aspects involved. None of his schemes, however well-intentioned, was understood or appreciated by his people, and none of them succeeded. Tughlaq's ideas of creating a spirit of unity between Hindu and Muslim of 14th century still holds good. 
Gandhi in 20th century made attempts to unite the Hindus and the Muslims. Nehru followed Gandhi's footsteps. As a prime minister, he wanted the two communities to be two bodies with one soul, but he failed. There were Hindu-Muslim riots in post-independence India and deep-rooted suspicion, doubt and distrust disease the blood in the veins of these communities. Karnan makes Tughlaq an idealist and establishes that in politics, idealism does not fail. It is bound to fail, especially when the idealist is impulsive. Tughlaq is an intelligent man and works meticulously for the people. Karnat astutely depicts the predicament of Muhammad bin Tughlaq, the monarch of Delhi. The idealism of Tughlaq and subsequent political disillusionment of the period are often compared to those of Nehru era. Karnat himself suggests this parallel in an interview quoted in his introduction to Tughlaq. And I felt early in the 60s, India had also come very far in the same direction. The 20 year period seemed to me very much a striking parallel. Jawaharlal Nehru indeed shared with Tughlaq an over ambitious dream to build a glorious India. Tughlaq forsook his rest and sleep to fulfill his dreams, but, he dies, but his idealism and vision were probably ahead of times, and his subjects could not fit it into his could not fit into his scheme of things, resulting in widespread social, economic, and political upheaval and chaos. Tughlaq paradoxically restored to violence and cruelty for the implementation of his idealistic plans meant for public welfare. Aparna Dharvarkar considers this later phase in Tughlaq's career as bearing a resemblance with the rule of Indra Gandhi in contrast to the earlier phase resembled the Nehru era. The analogies with Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru thus foreground the more or less well-intentioned idealism of Tughlaq's burning in the place first half and suppress the cruelty, depressiveness and cunningness of Tughlaq Aziz in the city. The analogies with Indira Gandhi and her political successors refers this emphasis and bring the two halves of the play together. She is closest to Karnat's protagonist in her propensity for choosing evil out of a compulsion to act for the nation in the self-destructiveness of her authoritarianism. The play demands a reading at two levels, one historical and the other psychological or personal. However, it can be argued that the play is not only about reading recent Indian history in the light of the period of Tukla, but also about the nature of subjectivity. It is to be noted that audiences, readers are led repeatedly into the consciousness of Tukla and the mind of Tukla has an overpowering presence in the play. The political decisions and innovative ideas of Tughlaq are, are a way ahead of his time. His amirs and subjects fail to follow him and become apprehensive about his motive. He pleads with them to copy. I have hopes of building a new future for India and I need your support for that. If you don't understand me, ask me to explain myself and I will do it. If you don't understand my explanation, bear with me in patience until I can show you the reasons. But please don't let me down. I beg you, Tukluk tries to bring about religious equality, but fanatics like Imam Uddin oppose. The decision to move the capital from Delhi to Dalatabad is a step in the same direction, but the impracticability of the decision puts off the people and the women to oppose the Sultan. In contemporary India, a large number of projects are planned for the welfare of the country, but because they are not well executed, they fail. Faced with opposition from his own subjects, Tukluk declares, I was too soft, I can see that now. They'll only understand the people. 
he becomes ruthless after this experience and orders everyone to move to Dwaratabad. He killed all opponents of his project mercilessly, but he is soon hung by a profound sense of guilt and turns to God. God, God in heaven, please help me. Please don't let go of my hand. I started in your path, Lord. Why am I wandering naked in this desert? Now, his words reveal his utter disillusionment and spiritual agony. He started on the path of benevolence, but being tragically ahead of his times made him a tyrant against his will. Similarly, his vision of starting copper currency also in, in a fiasco. His over-idealism brings about his downfall and his own people call him a madman in time. The playwright thus depicts Tukla as a divided subject who has acted cruelly but is not happy with the acts. He is a historical figure, but he is a symbol of the recent Indian leadership. Indeed, the most important issue is how subjectivity and history prescribes. Subjectivity can only be understood by grounding it in history. Thus, Tukluk's character is used only as a background to portray what is happening today. The double-facedness of Muhammad very much resembles the two faces of the politicians of today. In India, today, crores of rupees are spent to check famine and drought and also to uplift the poor and depressed, yet their condition does not improve. Because most of the money is misappropriated by administrators, any taxes imposed today is resented and is criticized. People hardly realize that the taxes thus collected can be utilized proper for providing more conveniences and comforts for them. Karnad has thus succeeded in giving the feel of life of the 14th century which is quite relevant to the contemporary reality in India. Thank you.